Hello. Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. I hope you guys all have had a wonderful day. I have definitely been enjoying the days. The days are getting a little bit longer, which is super nice this time of year. It's so hard in the middle of winter when it's dark at like five o'clock. And I've noticed just this week, the days are staying light until like 530, which is so nice. It's really nice. And I think it was Groundhog Day, which means that spring is coming. So I'm really looking forward to spring and summer and show season is coming up. I was actually just here on my computer and I was um, entering the show. There's a big show that's happening in Thermal on the 18th. February. So I'm going to take, I think we're taking four or five horses to that show, which will be super fun. I'm really excited. I love showing. I always get so stressed out when I'm entering the horse shows. Let me know if any of you guys feel this way, but I always just can't decide like, oh, should I do this test or should I do that test? Or, um, you know, I don't even know what to enter. So I'm like stressing about what to enter. And then this time of year, also, you have to go back and renew all of your memberships because it's the new year. So you have to go back and pay like USEF and CDS and USEF and get all your cards and everything organized. And I also have a young horse that I'm going to take to the show. And usually when I take a young horse to a show, like it's his first time that I've taken him away from home. He's turning six this year. It's really just about, you know, getting him away from home and kind of feeling what he's like away from home. I don't really have any specific goals as far as like, oh, I need to get this score. Or I need to achieve that. It's really just a fact finding mission the first time that you take a new horse to a horse show. And I think it's really important that you have that mindset that's like, okay, I have a new horse. I'm going to go away to a show the first time and it might not all be perfect. And that's fine. It's just kind of learning about that horse and figuring out what they need and what they're like at a horse show and the routine that, that they need to have a good show. So I'm looking forward to that. Let's see, who do we have here on Facebook? Hi, Jackie and Claudia and Cindy. And Sasha, Sasha says, hello from Pittsburgh. Everything is a sheet of ice here with a flood warning. Wow, that's crazy. Ice and flooding. I can't even imagine. So cool. Uh, let's see. We have some really good questions tonight that I wanted to talk through and answer, um, both from Instagram and Facebook. If you don't follow me on Instagram, it's at Amelia Newcomb Dressage. And I always post a lot of just cute horse pictures as I go through my day. So the first question is from Scarlett. How can I tell if my horse is overbending to evade the contact? That is a good question. And so when we talk about contact, we're basically talking about from our elbow to the horse's mouth. That's contact. Ideally, you should have a little feel of your horse's mouth. Like it should be, I always say like if you're holding a kid's hand and crossing the street, that's kind of the amount of pressure that you have with contact on your horse's mouth. You don't want to have your rein be totally empty, but you also don't want it to be super strong. So kind of in between those two things, usually if your horse is curling, like if they're going behind the contact, then your reins are going to end up being too light. And if this is the case, if your horse tends to go behind the contact and get too light, a couple of things that you can do. The, the best one is to think about connecting them from your inside leg to the outside rein. So you push them just a little bit sideways, like doing some little leg yields and really thinking about pushing the inside hind leg, getting them into that outside rein. And when they go to like dive and curl down, then at that moment, putting your inside leg and keeping them into the outside rein is the best solution. Okay, next question is from Alexandra. Uh, planning a week of training, how often to work on this and that as far as groundwork, hacking, etc. 
So this really depends on your horse and what fits your horse's needs. In general, kind of my routine with a young horse is different than with an FEI horse or a more trained horse. It's always important that I think safety and routine is always kind of the most important thing. So if you have a young horse or a green horse or a horse that you're worried about that you might get in trouble with or like fall off or something bad could happen, then you want to spend some more time doing groundwork, especially on the days that are cold or if they've had a few days off or if they haven't been turned out, then you want to do more groundwork. And as far as hacking, again, that depends on your horse and your situation. Usually what I do with my horses is I ride them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they have off. And then I ride Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they have off. And those days a little bit vary, like usually Mondays and Thursdays, the day off after they've had a day off is a little bit more like stretching and loosening work or maybe a hack day. And then the other days are more real work. And Saturdays, sometimes I'll take them in the, in the, for a hack. Or at my barn, we have this really awesome jump arena, which my latest YouTube video, I'm riding in the giant jump arena we have. So that's a really great way to mix it up and get your horse out of the dressage arena and just doing something different. Because that's definitely important not to drill your horse in the dressage court every day, but try to mix it up and hack them around the property or go over some cavalettis and just keep it playful. So hello everyone. Oh, I see Natalia is from Argentina. That's cool. My husband is from Argentina and he went there over Christmas to visit his family, but I didn't go with him. Everyone says I should go to Argentina, but um, I haven't yet. All right, Debbie from Wisconsin, um, Donna from Texas. Let's see, Claudia, what would you recommend working with a 12-year-old mare who was a broodmore for the last five years? She's a very calm girl, but tends to get bored easily and starts head bobbing. Um, yeah, so, wow, five years off. So since she's had so much time off, it's going to take a little bit of time to get her fit again. So I would really, you know, do a lot of like conditioning work, a lot of transitions. When she starts to get tired or bored, you know, give her a little walk break and then start up again. Sometimes when horses start head bobbing, like they're like going like this with their head, that's a sign of a weakness behind. So it, it's just a sign that, you know, her hind legs and her back really aren't strong enough, which makes sense because she's had so much time off with babies and all of that. So I would just recommend keep like gradually in, increasing the work, do lots of transitions, give her lots of walk breaks. All right. We have someone from Honduras too. That's cool. What other questions do we have? For those of you guys that are watching live, you can also type your um, your questions in. We're live here on Facebook and on YouTube. Also, if you haven't yet, I have a podcast. It's called Dressage with Amelia. So just search for it on your podcast player, and then you can listen to the, to the recordings from these sessions while you're doing something more exciting than sitting on your computer. Okay, next question is rain lane. Is it a thing? So the answer is yes. And basically rain lane happens when horses don't accept the contact or like I was just talking about when they start nodding their head around, then sometimes they can act like uneven or lame because they're like flinging their head around and not accepting the contact. So yes, it is a thing. The best way to figure out whether they're like rain lame or actually lame is to get off them and put them on the lunge line and see if they're still lame. If they're still lame on the lunge line, then they're probably actually lame. If they're just lame when you ride them, then it's probably because they're not accepting the contact and the connection. Okay. 
Um, let's see, Marianne, exercises for a stifle recovery. So always make sure whenever your horse has had an injury that you always want to consult with your veterinarian because I'm not a vet and I don't know exactly what kind of stifle injury your horse has had. So make sure you have the all clear from your vet. But some really great exercises for stifles are cavaletti work, like where they have to pick up their hind legs, hill work, and also backing like rein back can really help for stifles. All right, Donna, I got a little behind with moving my boys. I'm in the groundwork class. I fell behind. What should I do? In a better place, location with my horse, now all frozen, but I want to catch up or at least not feel lost. Okay, Donna, that's a good question. So I'm going through the Groundwork Masterclass, which is super fun. We've been having a lot of people at office hours. And at office hours for all of my masterclasses, basically what people do is they send in like little video clips of them working with their horses. And then I can actually show it on Zoom so we can watch them like doing the groundwork exercises. We have three um, young girls triplets that are taking the course and it's so cute to see them doing the groundwork with their ponies. It's, it's really special. So, but basically if you are enrolled in the course and you haven't really had the time or, or it's been too cold and frozen to work through it, it's not a big deal because you have that material forever. But basically, the course is really organized from like beginner to advanced. So I would just go through and start looking at some of those more basic exercises. And the beauty of a lot of the stuff on the groundwork course is that you can just incorporate it to your daily routine without needing to add a lot more time. So it's just like simple stuff. Like when you're leading your horse from the stall to the cross ties, check in with them, make sure they'll stop, make sure they'll back up, make sure they'll put their head down. Um, that kind of simple stuff that doesn't even add time, but it's just making sure that your horse is on the aids and listening. So, so yeah, Donna, you're not too late. We still have, we're still working a lot on our groundwork. All right, let me see what other questions do we have here? There were some good ones. Yeah. Oh, I really liked this question. This question was from Michael Green on Facebook. I hope this isn't a stupid question. Is it possible to ride in a constant half halt? If it is, how do you realize you are? So this is, I, I really love this question. And the answer is yes, that it is possible and incorrect to ride in a constant half halt. And I see this a lot with riders is that they're trying so hard to do everything right that they end up just being like so tense and so stiff all of the time. So the goal whenever you're riding, whenever you're training your horse is that you want to do as little as possible for the maximum result. So you kind of want your horse to be like, on cruise control to where you should just be able to set them at a certain speed and they should not go faster and they should not slow down. And so if you feel like you're constantly holding your horse back, if you're in a constant half halt, or if you're constantly driving your horse forward, then that's not good. And you need to come through and like be effective with your half halt. Like if I'm going along and my horse is speeding up, I might actually halt them or I might actually rein them back. But I don't just, you know, I want my half halt to be effective and then I want to release it. Because if you're having to half halt every stride, then what are you going to do when you have to leg yield? Now you're going to have to leg yield aids and make a half halt every single stride. And then what are you going to do down the line when you have to ride like half past zigzag or one tempi changes, there's no way that you can be half halting every single stride and doing everything else. So it's really important that you give an aid, get an effect from your horse and then release the aid. And that is, that's super important. All right. What other questions do we have here? 
Okay, Heidi, what is your best tip for getting a horse out in the neck? I have a five-year-old PRE that gets super tense and quick. She has an amazing stretchy trot, but once I start to bring her into a frame, she gets flustered and gets short in her neck. So I talked about this a little earlier in, in tonight's discussion, Heidi, but whenever you have a horse that curls behind that doesn't really want to accept the contact, you really need to work on that inside leg to outside rein connection so that you're basically engaging the inside hind leg and connecting the horse to the outside rein. And then through that, you're going to get them to take contact on the outside rein in a way that they should elongate their neck as opposed to just collapse, collapsing their neck. And then once you have contact, then you can regulate the tempo because it's really impossible to regulate the tempo when you don't have contact or when your horse is just shortening their neck. Okay, let's see. What else is here? Okay, another question. My mare is a little stiff in the trot to canter after coming back from an injury. Rehab meant a lot of straight lines. So now bending seems to be a bit more difficult. Any tips on getting her rounder and more through easier? So yeah, I think that that is always a challenge when you are rehabbing a horse because the, the protocol that the vets want you to follow sometimes isn't necessarily how we want our horses to feel when we're riding dressage. So once you have the clear off for your vet, then yeah, I would start doing like lots of circles and serpentines. And even if you can't do super tight turns yet, really think about getting your horse connected from your inside leg into the outside rein and through that lateral suppleness, when you can keep your horse connected from inside leg to outside rein, then when you ask for the canter transition, it's more likely that your horse is going to stay supple there. But again, it's like, you know, so much of dressage and, and training our horses, it's like a gymnast. And so your horse has to be really strong. You have to like build muscles on your horse but they also have to be really flexible. And so it's both of those things. It's getting your horse strong, but also getting them flexible. And when they're more flexible and more bendable, then that's when you have that throughness and that elasticity through the top line. So hopefully that helps you. Okay, Fiona. Hi, Fiona from Australia. That's so cool. I've never been to Australia, but I think it would be beautiful to go. I'm having trouble with getting a nice soft contact with my 12-year-old stock horse gelding. He tends to tootle around like a camel. <laughs> Do you have any videos or other tips you can offer so I can better improve this? I know it will take time. So yeah, whenever I have a horse that is like really stiff and locked up, I always start with groundwork exercises. And if you go to YouTube and just search like Amelia and groundwork, um, or I also have some videos about how to get your horse on the bit. So like Amelia and get your horse on the bit, but I would start on the ground and just teaching your horse to drop their head down. So teaching your horse, the pole release that like, if you put pressure on their pole, they put their head down. Then what I would do is I would work on getting the lateral bend because you always want to get your horse bending laterally before you ask them to just flex and, and go on the bit. That always is the best way. So get them to really bend to the left, get them to really bend to the right. And then when you take up contact, asking for that pull flexion would be the next step. And um, yeah, you just have to keep working at it. But horses are, it's amazing. Like an old horse can learn new tricks. And when you change the what you're doing with your horse and the approach that you bring to your horse and explain things to it, them, they will change even at 12 years old, even older than that. So that's really the fun part of riding and training horses and dressage is that they can improve and they will improve. All right, another good question from Heidi. Can you describe the aids you use to get a horse up in the pole and shoulders? 
Feels like I'm using upward half halts and bumping him up with my legs quite a bit to keep him there. He is fit and able, so I don't think it's a strength thing, just his preference of way of going, even though he is built really uphill. Okay, this is a good question. And when we show our horses, right, one of the things that the judges look for is that they want to see that the pole is the highest point. The other thing when you're at second level or above is that they want to see collection. And a lot of times people think that, you know, collection and getting the pull up the highest point is just simply about like lifting your hands and getting their head up the highest point. But what's really important is that as you train your horse up the levels and in order to get honest collection, it actually starts from the hind end. So it's not about just pulling the head up. It's about getting the hind legs to fold under. And when the hind legs fold under, then the withers can lift up because horses, um, their rib cage is not connected by any bony structure to their legs. So like this sounds morbid, but basically you could cut your horse's front legs off without cutting through any bones. And so what this allows is there's a muscle called the thoracic sling muscle that allows the horse to lift their withers up between their shoulder blades. Like it's an amazing feeling. I trained this horse named Catalina and I started her as a three-year-old. I got her all the way to the Grand Prix and she could like, it literally felt like her withers would pop up four inches when you were doing collected work. So horses can literally lift up their withers by using their thoracic sling muscles. So hind and under withers lift and then the neck arches and the pole comes the highest point kind of on its own. A lot of times people just think, oh, you know, they're curling, they're, they're, um, I need to get their pull up and they just lift up on the reins. But when you can address it from back to front, that's the best. So how do you address it from back to front? Um, lots of transitions, you know, lots of walk canter transitions, lots of rein back to forward transitions is going to help to get that hind end of your horse really under. Even like some little turn on the forehand is going to help to engage your horse and get the hind end under and the withers lifting up. Um, and the other thing is to really think about your seat and your position so that you get to where you're riding your horse more on your seat and kind of getting them to sit down behind and lift up in the withers by the way that you're sitting in the saddle. Because what happens is that if you're trying to like pull your horse up and up and up with your hands, it actually ends up curling them too much down. So you, you, there are times if I have a horse that's curling that I'll like bump them a little up and then I'll get sitting on my seat again and put my hands back down. Cause if you just keep your hands up the whole time, then it just makes your horse curl even more. Good. Okay. Claudia exercises for spooky horses. <laughs> um, my favorite exercise for a spooky horse is to just do lots of bending and really work on keeping them looking a little to the inside and off the inside leg because it depends on the horse. But sometimes if you have a horse that's really spooky, it's just best not to let them look at whatever they want to look at. So if you can keep them looking a little to the inside and off your inside leg and into the outside rein, then that's the best solution. And also when you have that control, when you have your horse really respectful of your inside leg, then they kind of know that even if they're spooked, like even if they're scared of something, they still have to stay away from your inside leg and into the outside rate. So good. We had a lot of great questions today. I always love hearing your guys' questions and I also have been very impressed lately with um, all the comments on Amelia's Dressage Club. It's so cool to see someone asked, I think, a question today about the leg yield. And there were literally 100 people responding to this woman's question about the leg yield. And I think that that is so special about this community that we have, that we are all helping one another, helping each other grow and it's really cool too, because when you can teach it, you learn it better. So if you can explain to someone 
how to do a leg yield, then it helps you to be even better with yourself, with your riding, with your leg yields. And so that's really what I love about this online community that we have is that we all support each other, encourage each other and share our insights and our ideas because dressage is for sure hard. And um, yeah, there's a lot of ups and downs and good times and bad times. So it's important that we have a community where we can encourage one another and kind of problem solve because I learn things even from reading your guys' comments, which is super fun. Uh, Claudia, when am I going to do the groundwork course again? Probably the end of this year. I haven't totally finalized my schedule for the year, but the groundwork course has been really, really fun. It's been so fun to see people working on this stuff with their horses and to see how it's changing their riding and their aids and their just their overall relationship with their horse. And, um, you know, when your horse is respectful and mindful of you on the ground, it just makes them so nice to be around and so much safer to handle. So that's really fun. So I have to go finish my show entries. I did two horses and I still have two more to enter. And yeah, what else is going on? Oh, my, we're probably, my husband wants to move. So we have an offer in on a house that's closer to the barn, which is exciting. It's really exciting because that's like my dream is to live at the barn. I'm so envious of all of you guys that get to live with your horses on your property because that's my dream. And right now my house is like, 30 to 40 minutes away from the barn. So it's pretty far and it's, you know, like it's a hassle if you have a horse that's sick or if you need to medicate or something, it's not really that convenient to just run back to the barn. But um, the house that we're looking at is like 15 to 20 minutes away from the barn. So that would be really exciting. Um, but it's definitely a lot of, a lot of moving parts to make that all happen. So Fingers crossed it all works out and I get to be closer to the barn and closer to my horses. And that's it. I'll be here next Thursday. So be sure to send in your questions and yeah, check out our podcast, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, there's always good videos to watch and that's it. Have a wonderful evening, you guys. So good to see you guys.